Good evening, all. Feel feel free to say your hellos. I'm not going to mute anybody yet. <laughs> hey, Jen. Hello from Cheryl and Barbara. I saw you. Hey, you guys. Hi, Hi Jim. I am going to try and turn this. Hey, Jim. Oh, there we go. Jim, how are you? Hey, Jim. Hello, all. Most it's nice to see Barker. everyone. Mr. Barker. John is ours. Mr. Barker. <laughs> hey. <laughs> Hello, Jim. Congratulations. <laughs> Congratulations to you, Jim. <laughs> Congratulations, you old oh. bugger. <laughs> Mr. Barker, it's great I'm to see you again. <laughs> <laughs> there he is. Ah, there's Joan. How are you? That's right. good. How are you doing? And Diana, how are you? Hi, Lisa. Hi. Oh, <laughs> Is that Barbara and Cheryl? Yep. Yes. Yeah. There they are. <laughs> hey, Barb. Hey, Cheryl. Hey. How are you? I think it's too bright. Hey, Lynn. Hey, Frank. Hey, and how you doing? Oh, oh we're great. great. Good to see you. Hey, good. We're oh, good. <laughs> we're working on it. We got it. We got it. We got it. Sorry about that. Oh, I've had it's a whole new body. It's yeah, a whole new body here. for me. Yeah. <laughs> hey, boy, Cheryl. We're good. Is we still, have one? we yeah. still have a bunch of people coming in. So in another minute, everyone keeps saying their hellos. Yeah. Hi, Pat. Hello. Oh. Dory. Hi. Hey, Dory. Hi. Hi. Oh, Donna, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm because I didn't want. I'm eating food. dinner, so I'm gonna be. Oh, coach, I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah. roast kind of yeah. Uh, yeah. Meeting to honor, and we normally do this in person. <laughs> 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 So hey, Jim. Really hey, Jim. Nice how are you? Twenty-five years. Hello, Greg. Great to see you. Andrew. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Andrew. 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 There they are down here. See them? Oh, there's your guys. Hey, guys, how you doing? It's so busy for me. Uh, it was a smaller Thanksgiving, but it was Thank you. Hey, Bill. Good, good. Boy, that's a long time with you, pal. Oh, yeah, it yeah. is. Uh, <laughs> okay. oh. There's Ward's brother. Look at right. this girl, Dovia. <laughs> I'm still better looking than you, Ward. <laughs> 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 So I'm glad you can yeah, that it goes without saying. I'm better with it. Yeah. <laughs> Remember Frank and Anne from James Deeds? Yeah. Oh, there's there. Frank and Anne. Uh, uh, of course. Uh, you're <laughs> you're How you doing, Jim? Uh, you're welcome. How are you? You're welcome. Alexa, turn trying to find face. me. Um, <laughs> Now, share my screen with you guys. Uh, I, I it's am not really plugged in. out here uh, for my other call, but I wanted to get yes. this set up. But what I'm trying to get is hello, Rob. Hello, hello, Alan. Kristen, this hello, is Jennifer. Jennifer. My daughter, daughter and Kristen, Lane, and daughter Kristen. <laughs> Alan Robinson, geez. <laughs> Alan Robinson, yeah. James Deeds. And Jim Deeds, how you doing? Uh -huh. Last Good, time Jim. I was in um, a a nursing home, but guy a friend of mine had both had this. What was his name? Um, no, oh, you're asking me. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Diane Post. Yeah. Hi, John Cantor. Is it all there? So, hey, John. John, good to see you. Hey. Okay. That's good. Yeah. That's good. Thanks, guys. John, John, oh, hi, John. Is so oh, hi, John. Is it good to see um, you? One thing is well represented. The, the devotional. We're going to give it another 30 seconds and then we're going to get started. Oh, okay. Pop, look at our sign. And look at the kids. That's too much. Probably, oh, come, oh, come, Emmanuel. Oh, my God. <laughs> This is this is truly an intergenerational group. I love it. Yeah. <laughs> this is quite a crowd. This is quite a crowd. <laughs> it's quite a party. Hello, Joe Henwood. <laughs> nice to see you there. 
Can I, I miss mean, a, I'm trying to point out everybody. I, here, I can so. see it right there. I can see the little. We have Rose Flynn, but Rose, we don't see her. That's great. Pat Carroll, good to see you. We have to see you on the river, Pat. Right, so, the uh, open back up. MCC coming back with fifth and sixth graders downstairs during the service. All right, I'm going to go ahead wow. and, and go ahead and mute everybody. Which is great. Um, yeah. Great. I mean, Ohio. Uh, yeah. And I want you to make it back. Yeah. Right. Phil, Phil's message. Do you have her name now? Uh, Glenn, what? Uh, what? The song was amazing. Did you? Did you? Did you? Did you? Did Message. Good. You have a pin video? Okay. Oh. Remove, remove the pin. Charlie, turning the lights out isn't going to make you look better. <laughs> they don't have that many lights. <laughs> hey, Jim. How you doing? Are you okay? Oh, it's Chris. There it is. Oh, there's Jen. <laughs> hey, Dave Casale, how's you getting so old looking all of a sudden? I've been all my life. Hey, how's everybody doing? This is, you know, great. Give me a minute. I, I just, I'm overwhelmed. Aww. <laughs> Aww. <clears throat> this is fabulous. Uh -huh. I look at, look here. It's my whole oh, life. Jimmy Deeds. My whole life's in front of Tell it. No. <laughs> you know, to be honored by you people is beyond my wildest imagination. Yeah. Well deserved. Hey, Jimmy Dietz, Penny wants you to go put your wig on, please. <laughs> hey, I just polish this up every day, Penny. It's good. <laughs> you it up just for me, right? <laughs> I know the feeling. Yeah, right. <laughs> yeah, right here, here, right here, right here too. Yeah. <laughs> Diane, how you doing? Hey, Jimmy. I'm good. What's up, Coach? I'm looking around. I see all these names. It's overwhelming. It really is. Yeah. So I'm going to place everybody on mute for a, for a moment, just so we can cut out some of the background noise. I'm, I'm continuing to let people in. Um, we have a huge number of folks that wanted to join in tonight into the celebration. 64. So um, it's going to be quite wonderful. So I'm going to put you all on mute just for the time being. How many? All right. So good evening, everyone. It's so wonderful, first of all, to hear everybody laughing and talking and, and just saying hello to one another. Uh, my name is Jen Weston. I'm the executive director of the head of the Schuylkill Regatta. And on behalf of the board of directors and the committee 50, which I'll explain about in a moment, we welcome you to our second um, story hour. And um, I mean, really just wow, we have uh, 95 uh, participants signed up for this evening. Um, so I want to just give a few housekeeping items to help with the sound and the flow of things um, for, for, the um, for the next hour. I've muted everyone just to eliminate the background noise. I think all the, we're all very familiar with Zoom at this point. Um, and you know it's really difficult to hear when the speaker's talking if, if there's background noise going on. So keep yourself muted if you can, but feel free. You have the ability to unmute at any point in time. And we want this to be as casual and, and, and engaging as possible. Um, so feel free to unmute at any time, okay? Um, be sure to put yourself, uh, or put your screen in gallery mode. So in, if you're not as familiar with, um, uh, with Zoom, up on the upper right-hand corner, you'll see uh, speaker view. And if you click on that, um, there should be something that says um, uh, uh, speaker view will give you um, a view of up to 49 people on one screen. And then you can shift through maybe one or two screens to see everybody there. OK? Um, I am going to encourage everyone to use the chat room as well. So if a speaker's talking and you want to add to that story, um, another way of doing it other than just verbally is you can use the chat room, which I see people are doing already. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, there's, a, there's an icon that says chat. If you click on that, there'll be a little chat room that appears on the side. And if you leave that up throughout the duration, you'll see the comments that folks are making. And you can also talk to myself and the um, facilitator, and we can help 
bring you into the conversation as well if you'd like that. Okay, so just use that to communicate with us. It's great. I am recording this. That was a great question someone already asked. So I wanted to make sure everybody knew that up front. It will be recorded and and we'll share it. Um, it'll it'll sit on our YouTube page, um, and we can we'll, we'd love to share it with each of you as well. Um, so you could pass it along to folks that couldn't be here tonight, um, and also be able to write down um, some of these stories uh, for the future. Um, and um, let me just talk a little bit about the format. Very, I'm gonna give a very short overview of how we kind of got here. Um, and then I'm gonna turn it over to Rick Stellick, who's gonna facilitate the evening. Um, we have a number of storytellers lined up that are gonna share for a few minutes each, and then we'll open it up to the larger group. Um, we already received some questions via email that uh, folks wanted us to ask of Jim. So we'll be sure to throw those out or feel free if you're online tonight to, 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 um, to bring them up yourselves. Um, I encourage you to use that little raise your hand icon at the bottom. Um, that'll help uh, us uh, pull people in um, so we're not kind of talking one and over one another. Or again, throw your name in the chat and say, I want to tell a story. And that way I can call upon you or Rick can call upon you. And uh, we know we don't have um, uh, people trying to talk over one another. Um, uh, let's see. Again, we want this to be truly something that's casual, so we're not going to be too uh, too stringent. Um, and by all means, you, you know, unmute yourself, talk. There's some stories that you know, uh, putting it in writing just doesn't do it justice, and we need to hear your voices. Um, and this is why we did it in this format in Zoom, uh, because in our first story hour, we did it in a presentation style where only the presenters could be seen. Um, but I think we were missing the fact that we really wanted to see one another um, and really chat with one another. So that's why we stuck with Zoom and we have to be good about it um, when we have large groups. Um, so just a real quickly, a little background on the genesis of this whole story hour. As part of HOSR's um, 50th anniversary, we wanted to highlight 50 legendary competitors that have influenced and catapulted the, to the regatta into a fall classic over the last 50 years. So we put together a committee um, who I'll introduce in just a moment uh, to brainstorm how to, how to go about doing this. Um, we knew the list could never be exhaustive, but we wanted it to be representative of, um, of, of, of the breadth of competition and the culture of the head of the Schuylkill Regatta. And we wanted it um, to expand it, not just to competitors, but also to crews and teams and coaches and, and really influencers. Um, we wanted it to be an opportunity for people to hear the stories of the legends that have made the Schuylkill River and Boathouse Row so important to the greater rowing community and, and honestly just special in, in our hearts. Um, so we wanted to celebrate the people of our sport um, and our community by passing down the stories through generations, bridging the past and the present and thereby affecting change for the future of our, for the future of our sport. Um, we published the first story during the HOSR virtual week in October, um, and then we, we, we've been pub publishing a new story each week. Uh, Jim was our second story, and we hope you all were able to uh, check that out. And so we'll publish a new story for the next 50 weeks leading up to the 2021 regatta. And real quick, I'll introduce the committee. Um, they need no, no description, and we have very uh, we have lots to do tonight, so we want to. Um, I'll keep their descriptions just to their names, but you guys know that they're all rock stars. Uh, Alan Robinson, Dottie Brown, Jim Dietz, Ellen Carver, Pete Simone, Christopher Blackwell, and Rick Stellick. Um, this committee is more than I could have ever imagined. They're brilliant and engaging and thoughtful, passionate, um, funny and kind, um, but above all, they're storytellers. And we would meet every Friday morning, and this is kind of where the genesis of the story hour came about. We would meet every Friday morning and beyond the agenda of producing 50 stories, um, we would just laugh and one story would segue into another story and it was actually very therapeutic. So um, when the HOSR committed to doing evening programming during their virtual week, we were doing concerts and a love letter to Philly, um, a con conversation on diversity and equity and inclusion. It was really natural to include a story hour with this group leading it. So we received great feedback that night. That night also exists on our YouTube page. Um, and it led us to the decision to continue these story hours um, once a month or so uh, with guests of honor and themes that are important or timely to our community. 
So that's kind of where we are. Now it's just time to have some fun, okay? Um, and uh, we are honoring c certainly someone um, who's had a uh, 90th birthday just recently. So our birthday boy, everybody just relax, grab a drink if you're so inclined. We'll raise a glass to, to Jim. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to Rick Stellick. Um, so Rick, don't forget to unmute yourself. And then he's gonna introduce our first speaker. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much everyone for being here tonight. And thank you, Jim, for being here. This is awesome. Okay, well, thank you, Jen. Um, that's uh, for the great introduction. Uh, you know, one of the few benefits of this whole COVID thing is that it has permitted us to reforge and remake uh, acquaintances and stories that haven't been told in years and to honor folks uh, as part of this exercise. I think this is going to be a great evening. Um, Jim, and very briefly, I'll, and I go back to when I first started rowing, sculling, 56 years ago. And I've always will be forever grateful to Jim because even though I never was coached by Jim and I was never a member of Undine, he took an interest in me. And for whatever reason, he helped me out both as a competitor and as a coach. And I have a couple of doozy stories that time won't permit, but um, Jim remembered every detail of them when I talked to him the other day, which is quite, quite amazing. And so I'm, I appreciate everything he has done for me over the years. But Jim was an easy choice for this honor tonight. Um, everybody's going to be speaking about various aspects of Jim's career. Uh, he is, pro very briefly, he coached over 60 years, both for Haverford and Undine. Uh, he won 24 national medals, which I think is in the top two or three um, uh, listing of national medal winners, only surpassed perhaps by a couple of guys from New York AC, one of which may be on the call tonight. Um, he was without a doubt one of the, the greatest lightweight competitor of his era and uh, beloved by all and feared by all as a competitor. Um, his, his mottos were he was, as a coach, he was, people were here to row, they were there to win, but more importantly, they were there to contribute to the sport of rowing, which he did throughout his career and his interaction with uh, various other programs on the river, including uh, women. The, the genesis of women rowing and also of youth rowing, which people will be speaking about tonight. Um, the, um, so without further ado, I'm going to be going right into the various speakers we're going to have. There's about six or seven speakers, Jim. And Jim, we're going to force you to be quiet for a while. I know that's going to be a challenge, but we're going to force you to listen and enjoy this and then chime in towards the end. We got a couple of real doozers of questions for you. We'll, we'll try and touch on. Um, but each person, I was going to is hopefully will stay around five minutes and will speak to their experiences with you, both as a coach and as a uh, uh, competitor, and also uh, as some other sideline activities you had, which uh, everybody may not be aware of, such as a basketball referee. So we've learned a lot about you, and I've spoken to all these folks the last couple of weeks, and the fact that we have 95 people is the last count is a tribute. Jim, to, to your long career on Boathouse Row and what you've contributed to this sport. So the first speaker tonight, uh, or participant, is going to be John Azard. Uh, John's been a member of Undine since 1973 and certainly has known Jim throughout that entire career. And he will speak to his experiences with Jim and Jim's diverse other activities besides uh, rowing down at the river. So, John, hopefully you are ready and available to go. Uh, hello, everyone. And Jim, how are you, my friend? Wonderful. <laughs> okay. I don't know if everyone knows this, but Jim was a quarter mile. And how do I know this is that back in the 60s, Jim and I <laughs> were basketball referees. This is when I first bumped into him, didn't know him at that time. And what we discovered is to be a basketball referee for the Department of Recreation working in South Philadelphia, you had to be fast. Why? Because if you call the wrong team, giving them a score or a point, at the end of the game, you had to run at least a quarter of a mile to your car to say, <laughs> and we used to talk about this. And Jim would go off in one direction and I would go off in another looking for the safe haven. You could not run directly to your vehicle 
So you usually ran further than a quarter of a mile. So everyone knows that Jim, back in the day, was a quarter miler. Okay. <laughs> Here's a great story. Jim and God. August, 90 degrees plus, I get a call in the morning. It's Jim on the phone saying, John, the white caps are up. Take your boy out on the school kill and take him through the course. Remember that, Jim? Yeah. And once. And we get down there. My son was rowing. He was about 12, 13 years old, rowing for a public school, believe it or not. This is before he got into private school. And we go down, and you know, when you're going up to Strawberry, it's wonderful. Now you make the turn, and it's time to come through Strawberry Mansion, and the white caps are coming down. They're coming over the guns. The cockpit is filling up. And my son's saying, Dad, this sucks. Now, Mr. Parker, he's crazy to have us out here. It was so bad that the park guards, remember when they used to wear the white hats when they were separate? They were following us thinking that we would be swamped. Now we have to go through Gerard Street. That was even more wonderful. Yes, and we are filled with water and we get back and the only thing my son could think of, Mr. Barker sucks, he's crazy. What's wrong with him? Why, did, why are we doing this, Dad? I said, John, your coach is like God. Whatever the coach says, you listen. If you hear two voices, the only voice you listen to, even if it is God, discount God, God never rode. Mr. Barker has. He's the coach. He knows it. Follow the directions. Well, race time comes up. The waves, the wind is up. Everyone's taking off. We were down in Delaware, Jim, and the course is on oh, white caps all over the place. And you know, if you're there, you got to go. You could see my son take off. He's leaving everyone about two and a half lengths of, in rowing. And after the race, race, which he wins, he's running up the gangplank saying, there is a God, and it's Mr. Barker. I couldn't believe it. So Jim, you were on that day, the only voice that a person should hear, and that's what? The voice of God. Okay. That's what I would tell all of my competitors when I coached just like you did football or whatever the sport was. And that was what was important. But then here comes the knocker. Jim Barker kept me poor for a long time. And I thank him. Yeah, Jim, you almost ran me into poverty. Thought I was going to have to leave the house and sell the cat and the dog. Got rid of the birds a long time ago. So I come in one day and Jim said, you know, your boy needed a pair of oars. I got him a pair of stem fleas. Stem fleas, they're kind of expensive. They cost like about $250. Jim said, work, go back to work and work harder. Okay, so I wrote the check out to the Haverford. Everything was fine. Came in another day, Jim says, we're taking the boys up to Craftsbury. Well, Jim, um, you know, I'm doing my internship uh, and really can't afford it. You know what the mantra was? John, you just have to work harder. Okay, I bit the bullet. John went to Craftsbury, but here is the kicker. They couldn't drive him back with the Haverford boys. They flew him back, flew him back. Jim, I can't afford an airplane ticket. What do you think the mantra was? Everybody together, work harder. Okay, that was all right. Uh, thanks, John, that's great. We didn't, we didn't have too much heat that winter, but that's all right. <laughs> then I walk into the boathouse feeling I'm pretty happy. I'm getting ready to graduate, get my master's, one of them. And Jim says, John, you know, your boy 
he's doing really great, but he needs his own boot. And at that time, my head sunk down. I'm looking at my feet and I hear, I ordered him a boot. Jim, I'm working real hard. I'm finishing up paying for his private school now. And you know what the mantra was? You're just going to have to what? Work harder. Thanks, Jim, because he did win the school boys and the Catholic League championship. And I'm now out of debt. <laughs> I really appreciate it. My wonderful hero, Jim Barker. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, John. I salute you. Thank you, John. Appreciate that. Um, before we move on, I wanted to mention, too, that you know, I was, uh, and Jenna touched on it, but I wrote in the very first uh, head of the school, which was called the Graduate Skulls then with many others. But I noticed in our research that Jim Barker also wrote in the very first Graduate Skulls Regatta in a master's double with a certain other very illustrious sculler by the name of Jack Kelly. And uh, that's a kind of a little known fact, but Jim was in the very first graduate skulls also with Jack Kelly, which was uh, uh, an interesting and great combination. So, you know, he's got a long pedigree with, with the regatta. Um, next speaker I'd like to have is, is John Cantrell. Uh, John, are you on? John, are you, did you make it? Okay, I'm unmuted. Okay, great, John. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. We can see great. Can, can, can Jim hear me? Uh, I can hear you, yep. Okay, how you doing, Jim? Good, I got John. three quick Jimmy Barker stories. Three quick ones. <laughs> First one's named 1965. I'm rowing at Penn, lightweight, for Fred Leonard's coach. He said, anybody who lives within an hour of the boathouse row has to row this summer at Undine because you've got to learn how to skull. Because if you don't know how to skull, you'll never be a good sweep oarsman. So he, we show up at Undyne, and he turns us over to Jimmy Barker. And Jimmy Barker has to teach us the skull. Now, Jimmy Barker likes to teach high school kids. But he doesn't like to teach college kids because we're too much trouble. We're always back talking and trouble. But he does it anyway, and he teaches us the skull. So we have a good late 60s, maybe a little early 70s. And then I sort of disappear from Boathouse Row. I'm doing a lot of running and, and uh, I'm still a member. I still show up once in a while. But years later, somebody calls me and says, we need somebody to fill a master's quad. And I said, okay, I'll, I can do that. That'll be fine. So I go out. The first practice, the very first practice, somebody, I don't know who it was, either the coach that was on the launch or somebody in the boat says to me, did Jimmy Barker teach you how to row? And I said, yeah, how do you know that? He says, I can tell by looking. And I thought, I took that. He didn't, didn't say whether it was good or bad, but I took that as a great compliment that somebody could look at me and say, Jimmy Barker taught him how to row. And I really liked that. That's my first story. My second story is uh, in the latest campaign, uh, I don't know which, which uh, election it was, but somebody said about his opponent, that he had a casual relationship with the truth. Well, Jimmy Barker had a casual relationship with the starting line. He always told us it was really important to get off the start. Now, I think he probably learned that doing the quarter mile dash, which you don't see very much anymore, but the quarter mile dash is all about the start. So anyway, Jimmy says to us, okay, I got one slot in the quad to go to the nationals and it's between you and Peter Mallory. Now, do you remember Peter Mallory? He was the mm -hmm. guy that wrote that book, yep. Rowing Sport and what? Most people know Peter Mallory. So Jimmy takes us up to the starting, the 2000 meter starting line and said, okay, we're gonna row the singles. I forget what he said, but it was something to the effect of on your mark, get set, go. And when he said, get set, Mallory started rowing. I look up at Jimmy, I go, hey, he jumped the start. Jimmy just shrugged. And all of a sudden, I had to take off three or four lengths behind already. I rode like crazy to catch Mallory. And when I caught him at the canoe club, I let him know what I thought of his stunt with words that would make John Hardigan proud. And then I was wasted. I was worn out. And Mallory 
and Jimmy went motoring by, by me. And Jim looked at me and just shook his head and said, kid, you got a lot to learn because I didn't pay attention to the start. But that is something I have learned. And I always think about Jimmy every time I'm at the start. How do I get jump this start? How do I work this out so that I time it perfectly? And my third story was one that took place a couple years ago. Jim was down at the boathouse, sitting on the bench. It was a bright, sunny day. There was a regatta going on. And he was just sort of reminiscing, talking to people, enjoying himself. And I was upstairs. I went upstairs because I had a race. And I guess I was changing. And I saw this kid sitting there. And he was really obviously sad. And I said to him, what's the problem? And I think he was a Penn Charter kid. And he said, oh, he said, I, 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 my coach put me in a single today and I flipped over. And I said, well, so what? That's, that's what happens when you row a single. Flipping is, is normal. And he said, no, I'm, I'm so embarrassed. I mean, I, this is terrible. I'm really embarrassed. So I said, kid, don't worry about it. But he wasn't listening to this old guy giving him a pep talk. He wasn't paying attention. A little later, I see him out in the dock and he's dressed and walking around, still sort of in gloomy. And I said, wait a minute, Joey. I said, come here, I want you to meet Mr. Barker. So I took him up to Jim. I said, Jim, Joey here just flipped over a single. He's new to rowing and he flipped over a single he's, and he's embarrassed. And Jimmy says, embarrassed? Let me tell you, embarrassed. He says, I'm in a big race, six boats across. I'm coming down. I got the lead. The finish line's close by. The crowd's cheering. He says, I flipped. I flipped the single right there in front of everybody and lost the race. He says, now, Joey, that's embarrassing. Flipping a single in practice, that's what happens when you row a single. It's just the way it is. And Joey looked at him, started to smile, started to laugh, and I hope Joey learned the lesson. Those are my three Jimmy Barker stories. I got many, many more, but Jimmy, thank you very, very much. Thanks, John. That's great, and I think all of us can, can relate to your story about the start of a quarter mile dash race and how that tradition has been passed down from generation to generation. And I remember exactly what you're talking about and learning those, those values, those important lessons on how not to steal a start, but they always said how to anticipate a start. So it's, it's a real technique. Thank you. Um, and that's your next person in line is Scott Fisher. And uh, Scott, <laughs> hopefully you're on board. And um, Scott's had a long relationship with Jim uh, and more recently, particularly regard to the uh, resurrection and refinding of the Gold Cup, uh, which has been a huge bone to the, the sport and um, was rescued from obscurity. So Scott, are you there? Yes, I am. Can you hear me? We can hear you great. So please, Scott, go ahead. Well, I'll, I'll just take it from there. I don't have a lot of stories, but anticipating the start is exactly what we were taught at Haverford and at Undine. And if uh, you guys recollect, we used to have a French start at Vupre Parte. If you uh, left after Ed Vupre, you just weren't going to make it. <laughs> That's pretty much how that went. So, uh, yeah, we were all well-schooled in the Jim Barker School of uh, anticipating the start. Um, you know, Jim, uh, I don't have to tell you, but uh, for the sake of others, I'm sure you'll hear this all night and I'll, I'll talk very quickly. You know, you're one of the most influential people's in, uh, people I've ever met in my life. Uh, for sure, in my own case, uh, absent your, your involvement in rowing, I would be an entirely different person. And I'm sure others will share that same sentiment. Um, I, uh, I actually uh, started rowing my freshman year at Haverford School and by virtue of that became a member of Undine. And uh, Jim, you and I have known each other for close to 50 years now, which is frightening, but uh, there you have it. Um, again, uh, I'll focus on your, your years at Haverford. I think uh, people, you have different people from different walks of life here. Uh, it's nice to see, by the way, uh, Bill Lepard. I haven't seen you in a dog's age, so uh, nice to see you. Uh, Frank Gio, all kinds of people out there. Um, you know, when, when you think about Jim, I've been thinking about this today, what, what is it that makes him a great coach? Because he's not a good coach, he's a really a legendary coach. And, you know, when I think about it and think about the things that uh, make you that way, 
uh, three things come to mind. Number one, um, unlike a lot of coaches, you're actually able to develop talent, uh, which is a unique skill. So you could take someone like me, for instance, who couldn't put one foot in front of the other and turn them into an oarsman. Uh, a lot of people can't do that. So you have the patience, despite your blustery personality to do that. And I, I really laud you for it. Uh, second, you uh, are just an expert technical coach, uh, probably the best in the business, uh, from certainly from your generation. And uh, again, I can remember as a, as a student at Haverford, uh, you know, you'd, you'd get into your single in your street clothes and one of us would hold the uh, stern end of the boat and you'd give a clinic for 15 or 20 minutes on the dock. Uh, you know, and we're all looking at you like, was well, this guy insane? He's going to flip in the water in his street clothes. But, you know, you, you were that good as an oarsman and that good as a coach that you could demonstrate, you know, the entry, the exit, uh, the slide control, you name it, the whole thing. And uh, that was incredible. And I think probably the, the best thing that you did as a coach, at least in my estimation, having been coached by you and coached with you, is you knew how to peak a crew probably better than anybody I've ever seen. So when the big race came up, you, you figured out how to, how to uh, peak that uh, single sculler or team just right so they'd win the big race. And, you know, your, your tenure at Haverford, which was uh, something in the neighborhood of five decades, was illustrious, uh, innumerable, uh, city championships, South Ferry championships, uh, schoolboy nationals, junior nationals, club nationals, you name it. You want everything in sight um, too many times to count. Uh, and again, it's, it's a tribute to uh, your skill as a coach, but I think more important, uh, and others have indicated this as well, um, you know, it's the life lessons, Jim. And you always said, if you got something out of it, you got to put something back in. And uh, I've always taken that to heart. And I appreciate it. And that's, that's probably more important than winning or losing races. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Jim, uh, we, we built a boathouse up in Conchahawk in the Conchahawk and Rowing Center a number of years ago. And the Haverford Bay is actually named after Jim. It's the James J. Barker Jr. Sculling Center and uh, a fitting tribute to your decades of service uh, to Haverford School and and all those boys, myself included, that you coached and mentored in life. And, um, you know, again, Jim, uh, we've had a lot of fun over the years. Um, I'm not going to get maudlin. Uh, I'll let, leave it to others to tell the inappropriate stories. But I'll, I'll leave you with uh, one very short anecdote. Um, uh, you know, you and I have always kidded that you're my Irish Catholic father and I'm your Jewish son. And that's true. Um, the 1981 Maccabi Games, we were over there, uh, again, an Irish Catholic coach at the Jewish sporting event is already unusual and kind of humorous. Uh, but uh, we, we felt that Jim needed to have, uh, you know, we wanted to make him feel comfortable. So we bought him a green yarmulke with shamrocks on it. And uh, we, we <laughs> got a picture of you at the Wailing Wall with our team in your green yarmulke. Jim, I hope you still have that. I do. Uh, but it was um, it was a great trip and a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, look, I love you. And uh, you and I have just had a long history. So uh, thank you for everything, Jim. Thank you, Scott. That was fantastic and uh, very heartfelt. So thanks a lot. Great stories. Um, next in line is um, hopefully Bill McNabb. Bill, are you uh, here? Yeah, I'm here, Rick. Good to see okay, you. Great. Um, just quick, I know Bill and I go back a long ways too, uh, not only from rowing, but also professionally. I worked with Bill out at Vanguard, or worked for him, I should say, in a way. Um, and Bill uh, came to Undine from Dartmouth. He was not a Haverford School uh, graduate, and but apparently Jim took him in any way as a, a college rower. So without further ado, I'll let uh, Bill speak to... Uh, your experiences, life experiences with Jim. So go ahead, Bill. Yeah, thanks, Rick. And it's great to see everybody and so many faces I haven't seen in, in a while and uh, hope everybody's surviving all this uh, as well as possible. Um, you know, I've known Jim uh, not quite as long as Scott, but uh, more than 40 years now. And uh, as Rick said, 
it really was serendipity. I was a senior in college trying to figure out what I was going to do, and I wanted to keep racing. And um, I was thinking about going into teaching because um, I figured I could teach and coach and, and, and continue to, to row competitively. And I got this inquiry from Haverford School about, um, would you be interested in coming down and teaching Latin, which of course was the last thing I was thinking I wanted to teach. Um, but uh, my rowing coach at the time said, uh, there's this guy who's the head coach at Undine and Haverford, you got to go learn to row from him. You know, he's, he's the best in the world, you should go. And it was really that, um, you know, that advice that sort of propelled, you know, really the next 40 plus years of my life because I came down and, and got a chance to row for Jim, but also coach with him, uh, much as Scott did. I spent, you know, many, many years uh, in the launch with him, uh, chasing up and down the river and, and, and learned so much. And I really want to build, um, I, I, for another forum, I told the Gold Cup story and, you know, Jim's influence there and, and what an impact he had. So I want to build a little bit on Scott's life lesson uh, theme, because for me, um, that, that's really what I remember most about Jim. There's the competitor and the technical virtuosity that, um, you know, he had. But um, I, learned, I learned two really, really important lessons from him. Um, and, and Scott alluded to one of them when he said Jim was really good at developing talent. Um, you know, he, he, he made Scott a really fast oarsman, so um, I rest my case. Um, but I remember after my first year of coaching, um, there was this kid um, who came out this second year, and I had coached this kid in soccer and, and other sports at Haverford, and he wasn't an athlete. He, he was sort of chubby, sort of chugged along, and you know, Jim said, um, well, you know, who's that kid? And I said, oh, he's, you know, he'll last about a week. And, you know, I, I tried to get his attention on somebody else. He goes, you know, I don't know. I, I like the way he rows and, you know, he's, he's picking it up pretty quickly. And Jim really worked with this kid a little bit extra. And um, this young kid went on to uh, be three times scholastic national champion, went to row at Cornell University, went on to represent the U.S. the World University Games. And, you know, just was a phenomenal, phenomenal endurance athlete. And it was just this great example that talent, you know, you, you don't always judge talent correctly when you just look at the surface. And, you know, it was one of those things I sort of absorbed and, you know, tried to apply it in other aspects of life. And, you know, it was really Jim making the point that um, what you wanted to look for was somebody who was tough, somebody who had a lot of perseverance, and somebody who was willing to learn and uh, you know what great lessons and then the second thing for me that um you know jim really really um emphasized and and others have have sort of alluded to it as well is passion um you know jim obviously he loved the sport of rowing he loved everything about it and he loved working with kids and he loved working with athletes but you know, he also had a, a philosophy that you, you, you needed to follow your passions and you needed to do things that aligned with your value systems. And um, this really hit home hard. Um, you know, I had I rode for Jim for four years and coached with him for a bunch of years and uh, had gone off to Wall Street. And uh, I, I was back actually for uh, Scott's wedding, as it turns out. And um, I was interviewing with this little company that Rick mentioned, Vanguard. And um, I was sort of, you know, betwixt and between, you know, should I leave Wall Street and, and, and go work for this little mutual fund company that nobody had ever heard of at the time? And um, I went over to see Jim and he said, let's, let's go out. We went over to Delessandro's and got cheesesteaks with everything and a six pack of beer and went and sat in his backyard and we talk, talked about life. And he talked about, you know, his career choices. He talked about maybe one day he, he, he had wished he maybe had gone into teaching. He talked about the impact of being around young people and coaching. But the thing he left me with was you got to do something that matches your values and matches your heart. And I remember going home and Katie, my wife said to me, she goes, what did you and Jim talk about? And I said, I'm going to take the job at Vanguard. And uh, it, it was his advice and you know his 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 teaching, if you will, that really drove that decision. And you know I owe everything uh, to that decision, career-wise. But it was really those two lessons about how to look at people and then how to you know make your own judgments, um, where you know Jim had such a profound impact. So while he 
influenced all of us as rowers and he was such a fierce competitor, those life lessons, they kind of transcend everything. And in a lot of ways, they're why we push so many young people into the sport. And Jim, I just can't thank you enough for that. It's, um, you know, it was really, really remarkable. Um, I owe everything to you, as you know. Um, love you very much as, as, as we all do on this call and uh, just appreciate everything you've done. Thanks, Bill. Really appreciate it. It's fantastic. Um, our next speaker is uh, Fred Dooling. Fred, are you there, my friend? Fred? Amazing. Fred. <laughs> For, I'm, I know you're on the call, Fred. You're on mute, Fred. Get off mute, Fred. Fred is like me. He's probably computer challenged. <laughs> Aren't we all? Are we all? At a certain age, we are. Fred? Hey, while we're waiting for Fred, I just want to turn the back of my head so You're Jimmy Barker and Jimmy Deese can recognize him. <laughs> okay? Now you recognize me, right? Yeah, I know. Oh, Jimmy, I know you anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, I'm not um, – Jen, maybe you can give Fred a call or something, but uh, I'm not sure why Fred's not – I know he's there, but he's – there's Edie. Edie, get, Edie will straighten yep. it out. I think they're getting straightened it out right now, Rick. That support okay. just arrived. Did he? Yeah, scroll scroll down to the bottom of the screen and to the there. left, there. click okay. on the mute. There you go. <laughs> Hello. Oh, there you are, my friend. Yeah. Sorry about that. You know, I was born the first half of the 20th century. So, you know, this computer business is... I know. Yeah. Well, for... It, Fred probably needs no introduction, but I'll give him one anyway. Um, Fred and I spent uh, 35 years together competing in a double. And um, before that, Fred was a scholar of great renown all by himself, member of Malta Boat Club. Um, Fred, uh, for a few years, rode uh, and coached by Jim Barker up at Undine with another scholar who unfortunately can't be on this call, but Bill Belden. And Fred and Bill probably, perhaps, who, in my opinion, were maybe the great, the fastest lightweight double ever. Everybody could argue about that. Many national championships. And one year they went over and rode in Moscow when Jim was the coach as the heavyweight double. Now, how big an accomplishment is that? Um, Fred, three-time national team member. Um, Fred, I'm not sure how many national championships, but... Um, you know, four or five years up at Undine before I, I lured him back to Malta. And um, then he and I spent the next 35 years rowing competitive in double. So he's been, uh, he's my close buddy all ever since and before. And he, by the way, he taught me how to anticipate a start. Um, from the very first time I rode a quarter mile dash against him, he said, look, young fella, you know, I was only two years younger than him. He's like, I show you how to, how to get us off quick on the line. And he, I remember those lessons forever. So, Fred, I know you probably have some great things to say about Jim, so I'm going to let you go. Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, speaking to uh, Jim's anticipating the start, we were, at the time, rowing at Undyne, we were so famous for it. We had T-shirts made called Barker's Bandits, and everyone knew right away what we were talking about. But Jim is, um, he, Rick had said, we went to the uh, 93, I guess it was then the European Championships in Moscow. And um, when we were, we had finished, won the trials, and uh, Jim was back at the boathouse discussing something, and he comes out mad as a hornet. He's just like, I said, you know, what, what's wrong? He says, oh, blankety blanks. He said, they, uh, they're they not going to sanction us. And we were like, what? What are you talking about? He said, well, they haven't heard the last of me. So with that, we go home. We have a nice dinner, celebratory dinner. And then all the while during dinner, Jim is just, you can see the wheels turning in his head. He, oh, uh. Well, by midweek... He had put together a legal team that uh, 
arranged a meeting with the, the new NAAO. Uh, and Jim goes with a big entourage of lawyers and all were there. And, and uh, we go and we meet and on and on and on and uh, getting nowhere with them. So the president of the NAAO says, look, you don't understand. See, you just don't understand. Jim looks at him and says, yes, I do understand, just like a judge would. We'll see you later. And by the weekend, they came and told us, pack your bags, boys, you're going. So Jim is, he has a sincere interest in his oarsmen that, and it's a sense of fairness. You know, it's like, that's just not right. You just can't do that. You can't decide not to send somebody. And not only was it us that he was battling for, it was two young men out on the West Coast also that they had said they couldn't go. But we all went, you know. Now, that was the one story. The story about... Uh, and Fred, let me interrupt you for one second. Of course, you, what you didn't mention was you and Bill's biggest sin was you were lightweights. Well, yes, that was... That was the embarrassment. They couldn't figure out how the two lightweights represent the United States in the heavy double. Well, yeah, that, uh, the, you know, and that was that was what we think really pissed them off. So, <laughs> you know, but um, I, I mean, to Jim's credit, it wasn't that he wanted to go on the trip because he had already been named the Irish national coach. So he was going to go anyway. But with Jim, it was a sense of fairness. Like, how can they do this? They just can't do this. And that was Jim, his sense of being fair. Now, one of the humorous stories I have with Jim, uh, Rick and I were rowing night before, we go out for a last minute row, the night before the head of the Schuylkill. We're coming around, we come up to Columbia Bridge, I turn, I look over the one side, I didn't look over my other side, and a single just takes our bow right off. Just <laughs> took it, literally took it off. So, and just so happened, Jim was coming by. So he fishes us out of the water, picks up the bow section, which was literally in pieces, picks it up, throws us all on the boat, and back to the boathouse we go. So on the way back, I'm like, oh, gee, this is awful. Jim, never to be without the last word, says, well, boys, I guess you won't be rowing that tomorrow. And I figured, no way. I screw you, Jim. We're rowing this. He says, I'll tell you what. I'll bet you a case of beer you won't be rowing that boat. And the fact of the matter is, Rick and I patched it all up, got it all on, put the bow back on, epoxy and everything else. And we rowed that boat. And I believe we won. But the what really is bothering me about this, Jim never paid off the bet. I never got the case of beer. So, uh, Jim, you still owe me a case of beer. <laughs> you wouldn't know what to do with it anyhow, Fred. Well, you're right there. <laughs> you're right. Well, I come up to your house and have them with you. That's that's about it for for Jim. I mean, you could go on day after day after day about you know the stories with Jim. I still stay in contact with Jim, and he's a great great guy. Well, uh, Fred, you're absolutely correct because when he threw the gauntlet down on us, you know, yeah, to row that boat. We that's all we needed because we spent half the night patching that <laughs> darn boat back together, and. Um, you know, we were going to let that pass just to prove him wrong. And <laughs> so, thanks for that story. Right. And by the way, you mentioned that he was the Irish national coach. And I don't know, uh, I saw on the list tonight, um, Sean Dre had uh, registered. Uh, Sean, are you out there perhaps? Uh, well, he'd registered. Maybe he'll be on later. But uh, Sean lives in Ireland now, to the best of my knowledge. But uh, Sean... Uh, Sean was coached by Jim uh, throughout some of his best years. So um, we will see if he gets on later. 
Rick, can um, you ask to see if uh, Stan Kwaklinski is on? Well, I will. Uh, Stan uh, uh, did um, did register, and when we get through all these speakers, I'm on to see if we can get to get him on on the call. All right. So great. Um, next person, uh, Liesl Hud. Liesl, are you there? Liesl? Here earlier. Wait a minute. Okay, I'm here. Okay, Liesl, great. Um, Liesl is, is a longtime uh, champion rower on Boathouse Row and had a lot of interactions with Jim and coached by him. And um, it's been a fixture and a, a coach herself for many years. So, uh, Weasel, I'm going to let you take it away, and you can speak to some of uh, your experiences with Jim, if you would, please. Sure. Um, Jim was, uh, when he first, I first started rowing for Jim one time um, when I got my first single. It was an orange Van Dusen, and I had just gotten it, and he said, um, if you need some help rigging that, I'll help you. And he's, I'm rowing out of girls club and we're right next door. And I was like, yeah, sure, that'd be great. And at the time I was rowing with uh, Rose Flynn and Anita Cipollini and Gus Constant was uh, going out with us in this single because he wanted to have somebody to row with, I think. Um, and Dick, it worked just pretty hard. Um, and then uh, Jim said to me, what do you want to do out of rowing? What, what is it that you want? And I was like, flabbergasted. I was flabbergasted with that one. I, I, nobody had ever asked me that question before. What did I want out of something? And I was like, well, I, I think I'd like to go to the Olympics someday. I'd like to be the best that I can be. And, and he was like, well, if you want to be the best at sculling, it takes five years to make a scholar. You have three years to get there. <laughs> and I was like, I guess I have to work hard. And he said, if you need some help, I'll help you. And Gus Constant said, and I went to talk to him about it. And he said, if Jimmy Barker wants to coach you, go and do whatever he says, because he's the best. And I was like, the best wants to coach me? Okay. <laughs> so I just did whatever he said. And I, you know, I tried the hardest that I could. I can tell you that I worked harder than I ever had before in any other sport. Um, I can remember many an 18 mile row and I'm gonna use a quote from Cheryl Cook that I was face down on the couch afterwards for about the rest of the afternoon on Saturdays. And um, it, it was just an amazing journey. But I'm gonna tell you another story. Jim not only coached me, he coached other women and he brought us along and we were always taught, like everybody else has said, you have to give back. And um, he kind of was like, you know, why don't you try coaching? And I was like, okay. Well, there was this woman, um, Ann Iskrant. I don't know, Jim, if you remember her, but she was the mother of uh, one of your rowers at Haverford. And she also had a daughter at Agnes Irwin School. And uh, she, her daughter wanted to row. And uh, she asked you, how do I go about doing that? And he said, well, first you have to find a place to row. And he said, why don't you ask the girls club? And Diana Post was the president then and she arranged for um, working out with the athletic director and they, they figured it out. And Anne was very instrumental in getting some funding. And uh, then Jim goes to Agnes Irwin, why don't you hire Liesl Hood? And I was like, okay. This is a brand new program. I've never coached a high school crew before. I've done a little high school coaching for basketball, but not for crew. And I was like, okay, I'll try it. And uh, needless to say, he mentored me through coaching Agnes Irwin School. We went on to win uh, multiple national championships. He taught me how to rig an eight. How to, I never rode in an eight, so it was like an interesting thing. I did row in college, so this was something new for me. And um, we, uh, at one of the nationals, we beat um, St. Joe's Prep with the number of medals that we won at nationals that one year. It was amazing. It was a really good ride. And I just have to thank Jim for everything he's done. He's been, as everybody else has said, he is an amazing force in rowing. He's an amazing force in my life and my family's life. And I, I just love him to pieces. He's my other dad. That's my story. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, uh, next is uh, someone we all knows is uh, Joe Quaid. Uh, um, Joe Quaid is currently the coach of Undine and kind of took over the reins uh, from Jim uh, when Jim phased out. And um, Joe, if you're there, um, can you uh, chime in and say some words about Jim? Sure. So uh, can you ever hear me? Uh, we can. Thank you. Okay. So a lot, a lot of good memories listening to these stories. Um, I kind of forgot about the, uh, the starts. Uh, one of these I remember when I was listening was the, the line in 10 or 12 singles up across for quarter mile dashes. And if you got off fast, you were in good shape. If not, you were in 11 boats wash or 10 boats of, of wash. So a lot of fun. Um, one of the things wrong with Jim, wrong for Jim, it was, it was you worked really hard, but it was a lot of fun. And you also learned a lot. And what I want to talk about more than uh, stories were some of the uh, the impacts that he's had on uh, my life besides, you know, outside of rowing as well as in rowing. Um, a couple of things that I think for me have been really important, I think for other people as well. Um, with Jim, he made it a point to, to let at least me and I think most people know that, that rowing is a passion and you can be really competitive and you know, it's a great sport and all that, but there's other things in life beyond rowing. And, and one of his, uh, you know, big uh, things that he loved was his family. Um, and it's one of the things that I talk about with the guys that I coach now. We have our, our annual meeting and I try to emphasize that, you know, uh, your family should be first in your life, um, your work or school and then rowing. And, you know, um, I think it's, uh, for me anyway, that was a, a really important lesson to learn. Um, before that, I guess I hadn't really thought much beyond, you know, the next week or month. So that was, that was a, a big deal for me. Um, and the other thing, a couple of people have touched on it, but was to give back. If you've, if you've gotten something out of, uh, out of a sport or an organization, um, do what you can to give back. And that's been something again, that that's been really important, uh, part of my life. Um, you know, I, I, took over coaching when Jim retired and it's something that I still enjoy. Um, and one of the things that I'm kind of proud of is a lot of the people that I've coached have also given back, you know, they've become uh, members of Undyne, uh, not members that were members, uh, officers, officers at Undyne. Uh, one of the guys I coach is helping me coach now. So um, it's kind of what, what's keeping things going at Undyne. We're, we're a real volunteer organization and, um, it's very important that we have people that are that are still willing to give back. So, uh, Jim, I just want to thank you for everything, and um, that's that's what I had to talk about tonight. Thanks a lot, Joe. Appreciate that. And like you and so many others, you're carrying on the kind of the long line of coaches and legacies that go from generation to generation. And all of us were lucky, and you in particular, to have someone like Jim teach you how to coach. I guess is the best way to put it. So, um, you know, and I, a lot of us learned from, from his style of coaching. So thanks a lot, Joe, for those words. Um, next person I'd like to introduce, uh, hopefully he's on, is John Leonard. John, are you on? Yep, I'm here. Hey, John, how are you? Good to see you, Rick. John, John is currently the president of Undyne, um, but also he goes back, and I think many of us know, and, and his, his great father, Fred Leonard, who was for many years the coach also at Haverford and Undine and went on to be a highly respected coach at Penn for the lightweight team for many, many years. Um, and so John became a scholar himself, obviously, and has continued to give back to the sport and now is, uh, is uh, elevated to the presidency of Undine and taking on that mantle. So um, I asked John to, to speak tonight and um, uh, say a few words about Jim and, and what he's meant to Undine as a club. Go ahead, John. Great. Thanks a lot. So I feel underqualified after a lot of these speakers that just came before me, but I feel like I can stand on my dad's shoulders, was one of Jim's peers. Like Rick mentioned, like Jim took over coaching the Harford School for my dad, and they rode together. One of those medals that Jim got was in a quad with my dad. So I, uh, one of the things I can trace back that hasn't been mentioned tonight, like Jim, my early memories of Jim Barker I was a little kid, so I've known Jim literally all my life since he was running with my dad before I was born. 
And um, I remember family get-togethers. I hope Jim remembers these, that the, us and the McFaddens and the Barkers and a few other families would get together for like 4th of July or Memorial Day or Labor Day and just have these great family parties. And that's just uh, one of the highlights of my childhood with uh, all the kids would have fun playing, the adults would do whatever they were doing. We didn't pay any attention to them. That really is one of my fond childhood memories. And I want to thank Mr. Barker for, for being a part of that. And um, it's great to see all the Undine members as part of this call. And I know that Jim has been just a significant, just literally historical member of Undine with all the years coaching and all the, all the rowing success he's had. And I just want to thank him for, uh, for being a lifelong member of Undine and the club. On behalf of the club, I'm just going to just thank him and make my little speech here pretty quick and let the next person get on with it. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. We appreciate that. And I know Undine appreciates Jim's contributions over the years. It's been fantastic. And you go down to the club, which I've walked through many times, and you see evidence of Jim Barker everywhere, which is, which is great. And not to mention all the national championships he won for you guys over the years. So thank you very much, John. Um, Next person is, is, I think you know well, Jim, is uh, a certain Jeff Barker. And I also understand, I think Jim Barker, you're the younger, may be on the call also. Jeff, are you there? I know you're taking your daughter up to, to, uh, to, to the airport today, but did you make it on the call? Um, maybe not. Try again. <laughs> Try again. He, he said he's got to do it from his car. Maybe not. Yes. Um, he is most certainly on the call. Okay. He may be having issues getting off mute. This okay. is his daughter at the airport. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, Kate. How are you? Hello. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you can get, yeah, if you can get your dad on there, that would be great and say a few words. Um, to, to tell him not to talk and drive, though, whatever he does. <laughs> Well, that was Katie. Did you ever see him drive? There, he's, he's definitely on the call. Is there a way to unmute him as the moderator? He may be having issues with the mute button. Um, I don't know. Jen, is there a... I'm trying to do that from my end. Um, okay. Rick, do you want to jump over to Ed Cirillo real fast? And then let me work on... Yeah, we had a, we had a uh, message from Ed Cirillo. Wanted to say a couple words. So, Ed, could you do that? Nice to talk to you again. It's been a few years. There. Am I off mute? Yes, you are. All right. Yeah, it's been a while, Rick. Hello. And likewise, Fred and a couple other faces I see there. But most of all, hello, Jim. Okay. Um, it, I've got two quick comments I want to make. It's been some 50 years. Well, first on the uh, anticipating the start anecdote. <laughs> uh, before there was the two-click French start, there was a three-click English start. Are you ready? Ready all row. Uh, but Jim pointed out to me that the quarter mile starter way back when used a shotgun for the third click. And because of the blast of the shotgun, he turned his face away from the, the oarsman as he pointed the gun up in the air. So it was very possible that one could leave on the second click or at the, as the shotgun, as a starter turned his face away. And uh, so it uh, provided me with some, let's saw, shall we say, some quick starts in the quarter mile early on. Um, but um, for Jim's prowess as a oarsman and his as a scholar and his success as a coach are well known. But for me, Jim is just a model citizen. Uh, I don't know where he got his anchor and his compass, but in the 50 years since I've left Philadelphia, both in academia and business, there is no one whose paths I've crossed who is represents for me what Jim does. And I think along with his success as a, a scholar and a coach, that's what's important to me about Jim. Um, and I, I just think of a um, comment or a quote from uh, Walt Whitman about Ulysses S. Grant, that he is at once so ordinary, yet so very extraordinary. And Jim, um, you know, again, I don't know, you know, where you got your anchor, but, but as I said, there is no one I know who is a more of a model citizen than you. 
Rick mentioned, and I think Fred, I think Fred also were originally rode out of Malta. Well, I was rowing out of Vesper as a competitor of the Harvard School. And I transferred schools in my junior year and started sculling. And one day as I was leaving the boathouse, there was Jim Barker sitting on the park bench outside waiting for me to tell me or to offer me that I could row along with the Haverford School and he would coach me. And I think that was what Jim represented to everybody. And so Jim, my hat's off to you. Um, <laughs> you've been a, a role model for me forever and obviously for others as well. May we, may we be half the person you are. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Ed. Thank you, Ed, and it's great to talk to you again after all these years. So uh, this, thank you very much. You bet. Um, That's great. I think Jeff is unmuted now. Okay. Jeff Barker, are you on? Rick, sorry about that. No problem. I think I am. I, yes, I had to pull over, disconnect navigation, which now means I'll get lost <laughs> and uh, and try this. So, <laughs> well, first of all, on behalf of the family, I, I want to thank everybody. This is a a tremendous night, tremendous honor for my father and behalf of the whole family, many of which are, or most of which are on the phone right now for of multiple generations watching this, uh, we want to thank you. Um, I, I think everybody knows uh, how wonderful an oarsman, coach, competitor, and man my father is. Uh, what only of a few of us know is uh, that he's actually much better at one other thing, and that's being a father. Uh, we, were, we were blessed, uh, without a doubt. I remember when I rode, people always wondered, what's it like to have your father as a coach and put up with rowing 24-7? And it wasn't the case. My father had an absolute steadfast rule of separation between the boathouse and home. And the best story to explain it is I remember one particularly pleasant workout uh, with him, which I'm sure everybody who's ever rode for him can remember. And we're coming down the boathouse stairs arguing about something. And as we walk through the front door of Undyne, he turned to me and said, what's for dinner? And I looked at him like, not saying, but thinking like, what the hell do you mean, what's for dinner? And he's like, we're now, we've left the boathouse. We're now father and son, not coach. And he shut it off that quickly. And we went home as father and son. And as a result, you know, our rowing careers and our father relationship as father and son stayed separate and, uh, main, you know, allowed for a tremendous relationship at both ends. So. For that, Dad, and for everything you've done for myself and everyone else in the family, we thank you, we love you, and um, we're happy this is such a great night. Thank you. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Rick. Love you. Thank you, Jeff. Appreciate that and uh, taking the time, and this is great. We can be able to catch you on, on your errand up there. So drive safe, please. Um, you know, we've had several people also want to speak, but I just want to uh, finish up on one or two others. Uh, before we go on to some of the other folks who want to chime in, which is great. Um, Chuck Patterson, are you there? Chuck is a member of Malta Boat Club. Yes, I'm here. All right, Chuck. Yes, uh, I'm here. Hi, Chuck. Um, I'm going to let Chuck speak yes. uh, because we had we have an interesting situation this year regarding Jim. And, and Chuck, you can just kind of explain to what's going on and with Jim and how we're going to handle that. So go ahead. Well, I'm the chairman of the Illman Award Committee at Malta, and uh, we have given this award annually since 1960. And there's some history behind that. And many, many great rowers and contributors have won this award. And Jim uh, is our award winner this year. And uh, the award recognizes someone who uh, has contributed their life uh, to the sport of rowing. Uh, and we try to honor that. And uh, we've been hearing all evening how Jim has done that. And uh, I only have a few memories of Jim. I never rode for Undyne or others there. But I remember early in my career, back in the early 70s, I was rowing for Malta. And I won uh, the intermediate single in the Schuylkill Navy Regatta, my first one. And Jim was at the boathouse for some reason. And he came up to me and he was uh, so sincere in his congratulations and his encouragement uh, to keep going, keep rowing, and, and uh, I have for 50 years. But uh, the irony of this whole thing is that the day of the Illman Award ceremony this year was March 14th. And that was the day that uh, Boathouse Row was closed. Uh, I guess Friday the 13th, uh, schools were closing and, and the decision was made 
And we, we had to uh, come to that decision a little bit earlier, actually, several days earlier. I talked to Joan, uh, the family, and uh, we had hoped that we would be able to have time this year to make that award. At this point, we're hoping we'll get back to the boathouse sometime and be able to have Jim there and have everybody there for it again. Uh, th thanks, Chuck. Uh, it's a very important award. Malta's, like Chuck says, given out for 60 years. This would have been the 60th anniversary of that award. And it was kind of long overdue to be given to the gym. So we're, we're glad it was gonna, we're going to make it happen. Um, before we move on to some of these other speakers, I'm going to let uh, Jim has been sitting there very patiently having to take all this in. Um, and talking to folks, as Jim, over the last few days, I heard two things about you. I heard many things about you, but two things in particular. One, they said, make sure Jim tells a story about becoming the champion of Japan. <laughs> <laughs> because there is there is a uh, Undine Boat Club, a plaque uh, recognizing him as the uh, champion uh, rower of Japan, national champion. And then the second one, you can ponder maybe why you're answering that, is we had a, uh, from John Campbell a question for you. And this is a tough one. I would know how to, I know how everybody would have their own answer, but in your opinion, who is the most, the best pure sculler, P U R E sculler, you've ever seen? Now that's a loaded question. You don't have to answer it, but why don't you start out with maybe your experience in Japan? And I'm not sure the exact year, 1950 something, I'm sure. So, Jim, you're on board. Well, that's a very special time for me. Um, I was in the South Pacific on Okinawa. I was in the army and um, I got called into the day room and the, 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 our field first said to me, do you row boats? And I said, what do, do? Said, do you row boats? I said, I guess I do. He said, well, here's the thing he said for you to go up to Japan to row in a boat race. And I said, well, how the hell do I get there? And he said, that's up to you, not me. <laughs> so I walked out of the day room and I'm standing there and I said, how the hell do I get to Japan? So it was a field first sword and he said, go over to the Kadena Air Base and put your name on a manifest. So I went over to the Kadena Air Base, put my name on a manifest and um, I'm standing there and it's a car and the, this lieutenant in the Air Force comes to me and says, where are you going? I says, I hope to go to Japan. He says, I'm going to Japan. You want to go with me? I said, certainly. He says, I, but I fly a B-29 and they're not exactly passenger planes. So I, I didn't give a damn what, what he was flying in. So I took off from Kadena Air Base in Okinawa on a B-29. There were no seats. I had to sit with my, with my legs in the Bombay doors. Thank God they didn't open them. <laughs> and um, I froze my ass off. You ever fly at 30,000 feet with nothing on? So anyhow, I got to Japan. And um, when I found out the reason I got on this was Bill Connect. They had originally asked Bill Connect to be the, the single scorer. And um, he had to go back on rotation, which he he was glad to do that but anyhow uh, I got the row in the race but it was funny people talk about starting and what happened and I didn't know the guy when I got the, the guy was my sort of mentor and he said this is how we start the races in Japan and he said this, the guy stands up on a big platform with a red flag and he starts you yeah you know whatever the hell and then he, he would say something they dropped the flag so I had no, no idea what he was talking about. I had no idea what they were doing. And I get up on the starting line and when the guy starts, Yui, I, and it, I was already gone, you know? So the, my mentor, that that was in the heat. So the mentor comes up to me and says, Mr. Barker, I have some people complaining that you didn't wait for the start. <laughs> <laughs> so the next day I, I made a point and I got also in the finals I got up there and I stood on the floor and I, I got two guys one was their university champion and one was their club champion 
and the guy started yori yori whatever, and he raises the flag up, and I waited till he dropped the flag, and I sat there, and I I figured I'm going to count the three, and then I'll go. So when I got the two, the guys with the flag, he huh? do he do he do he? He said, you know, but anyhow, I had left at least a length and behind everybody else in the race because I didn't want to hurt, insult my Japanese friends by stealing a store. So I, I did store it on us the second day, the second day because it was against my religion to do that. Yeah, you know? <laughs> but uh, it was a great, it was a great a great experience. Uh, I remember coming back to Okinawa, and there again, I, 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 I was like a week or two overdue, and I walked in, and the company manager said, where the hell you been? And I said, well, don't you remember, I went to go to Japan to row a boat, he said, what the hell, well, you're in the Army, you don't row boats in the Army. So anyhow, that's how I ended up back on Okinawa. Nobody in the Army gave a rat's ass that I won or what I wrote in is just get back to work and do your job. And that was it. <laughs> no, that's, it was a lifetime experience. Uh, the, the, one of the, the Japanese doctor who was my mentor came to the United States. He ended up being the mayor of Tokyo, Su Suji Azuma. That, I said it right. But uh, he came to my house for dinner and, and um, I had everything set up, I best I could. And my father, I said to my father, I have this uh, Japanese doctor coming for dinner. Would you like that? My father said, I wouldn't sit down at the table with that Jap bastard. He said, he, you know, he fought all through the Pacific. So there were no good Japanese to my father. And, uh, but that's how it just sort of had a, rolling effect to my own living kitchen and a Japanese doctor we had for dinner didn't didn't particularly care my dad didn't care that I was going to give a dinner to a Japanese who would eat food all through the Pacific so I can understand where my dad was coming from. Hey Jim do you do you want to um do you want to venture an answer to that question from John Campbell about the best pure scholar you ever saw? Or is uh, that I got one sitting right here. Uh, he wasn't a best scholar, but he was one of the fastest, Jimmy Dietz. Yeah. That, that's for damn sure. And uh, there, there's Larry Lukatsky, another great scholar. Uh, there were so many. I, I went up against so many great scholars, and that's what made you feel so good. I mean, I remember hating Jimmy Dietz. I mean, I just thought he was the worst human being walking in shoe leather. And, <laughs> And um, um, Larry McCassie wasn't, wasn't much better. And I'm going to say one thing, I, you all talk about quarter mile dashes and it still stands. You can look up the 4th of July. There was a 4th of July regatta and I rode 108 in the quarter mile dash. And Larry McCassie spent his, the rest of his career trying to row 108 quarter mile dash. So that's something I'm very proud of. It was fun. But, yeah, you know, we, we had great people rolling in. I mean, I hated everybody in New York AC. And we would, what we used to call getting soul drives. That was being cheated by Jack Soul. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you, we went up to New York AC and you expected to get cheated. You expected. Yeah, uh, one more quarter mile dust. I got on the start line and I, the Undine had just bought me my first new boat. And I was so thrilled with that. And I get on a quarter mile dash, there's like five or six guys in there. And it was a guy named Ed McKenna, who was a Jimmy Delhill. He was a character of characters. And I rode, well, no sense special. I rode the quarter and I finished and I'm pulling into the dock. And um, Eddie McKenna's just pulling in the dock. And Jack Hogg was ripping him up, you know what? And he says, I told he, I told I knew what was up. And I said to Eddie, if you run into my new boat, I'm gonna beat the living crap out of you when we get back to the boat. Huh? So of course, Eddie was a foot shorter than me, and he didn't do it. And Jack's always chewing his ass out for not running into me on purpose in the quarter mile back. And that's the stuff that went on, right, Jim? You know what 
you wrote for the guy. I mean, we used to call it getting sober, right? Yeah, well, well Jim, we, Jim, got, we asked, got the same thing. It's it's amazing how similar you and Jack were as far as oh, mentors yeah. and everything else. It was like <laughs> we'd be going to Philadelphia, and it would, and my first quarter mile dash was I think at the Independence Day, and my advice from the coach was don't wait for parte because the guys from Undyne won't, you know. And uh, <laughs> Liesl hit on on another note that that resonated with me tonight when she said that you told her that it would take her five years to become a, an elite scholar. And Jack told me, Liesl, that it would take seven years. So I can only deduce from that that Jimmy Barker is the better coach, you know? <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, Jack, very few people, uh, all you people, nobody knew so much, yeah. except maybe Jimmy Dietz, who rode up there. But... Uh, Jimmy Deeds didn't have, I mean, Jack Sullivan didn't have a honest bone in his body. <laughs> Am I right, Jim? <laughs> he he worked every angle as a New York City cop. He sure did. He sure did. But <laughs> but Jimmy, what, what you did in the collaboration between you and Jack, I mean, you were the only guys in the country that were producing scholars for the national team. You know, and you look at, at Rick and Fred, you know, winning the heavyweight double and going to Moscow in 73. Well, it was Klikatsky and Belden working together, two lightweights that won the heavyweight double and went to the Olympics the in 76. Yeah. You know, so it, 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 there were so few people influen influencing sculling in this country, Jim, that, yeah. I mean, you were the basis for it. You, you were the guy that was, was helping to create our teams, you know, and the country owes you a, a debt for that. <laughs> Well, thanks, Jim. And, you know, coming from somebody that was on the team most of the time. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, I, I don't know when this is going to end, but let me just finish up, if I may. Yeah. This is a great experience to be held in rega high regards by mm -hmm. such wonderful people. Right. And the people that made my life, made the sport, and... You know, I'll I'll go my to my grave thanking every each one of you for what you've done what you've done here tonight. I know it means so much to me and my family, and uh, I thank you all from the bottom of my heart. Thank you. Well, you're welcome, Jim. And I think it's, it, Jim. It's, it's so much. It's so great to hear Jim Dietz and and and, and Jimmy talk about Jack Soldier because we all can tell soul stories going all night here. But we got some <laughs> other folks that like to also speak, Jim. And um, both the both the Chibo, Gabby uh, and the and the Chibbons would like to speak for a moment. So, Gabby, you want to you on there? And can you? Um, Let's. I like to speak, Mike. Oh, there you are. Both of you. Great. Hey. So, first of all, hey Jim, we both salute you as as a wonderful coach and a, a hell of a man. So, and and the other thing I got to say, Jim, when Gabby came to America. She asked you to help coach her. Yes. And, and her words to me was, the best coach on the Schuylkill was Jim Barker. And, and that spoke for itself right there. And the other thing I want to tell you, Barker, is this. Contrary to what Charles Murray told you, I wasn't the guy that was stealing your gas. All right? <laughs> and that's what I got to say. <laughs> <laughs> That's still up for discussion. Oh, come on. Give me a break, will you? <laughs> <laughs> well, that was, that was, people don't know that Undine and Penny C were next to each other in uh, Haverford and um, Bonner. <laughs> Bonner. <laughs> Bonner, but we had our own gas can. Well I, well, I knew that when Bonner ran out of gas, he, Pete stole my gas. And I'd come out and get. <laughs> And he, he uh, vehemently denied it, though, but he was stealing my gas since saving money for Bonner. <laughs> <laughs> hey, you know the other thing? Hey, Jimmy Dietz, I got to tell you, you think that Undyne uh, and, and New York AC had a certain enmity going on there? You should have seen oh. between Bonner and Hereford, even though we didn't row in the same races, every time we drive, row by the dock, Barker was yelling. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
But uh, hey, this is a wonderful thing. And thanks, Jim, Jim Barker. Thank you. That's all I can say. What a what thank a you. wonderful thing. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Gab. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna flash up a picture that someone sent me today, and then they can uh, talk about it. Everybody see that? Yeah. That bring. Oh, yeah. Hey, Jim, you recognize oh. that? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, it's Ann Cutler. I just uh, I dug this out of my uh, box of pictures today, Jim. I'm in that bus. I was up there one week coaching with you, and uh, what I wanted to say is. Um, you know, I didn't appreciate this till much, much later, but how you used to work a full day at work and then come down and deal with us on the river, um, gave your Saturdays and your Sundays. And, you know, certainly your summers up at Craftsbury where you were coaching, you know, pure novices that you affected. And uh, I didn't really appreciate that till later in life. So thank you. Um, thank you for those lessons and, and a lot of fun at Craftsbury. Uh, Jim used to uh, load up all the campers on a Wednesday and take that old bus down to uh, the center of Craftsbury Common and raise hell for a few minutes. <laughs> it was an old home day. Yeah. And they used to give out a prize for the best uh, float. And what we did, we would get the load all the campers in the boat, in the, in the bus. And then we'd stick oars out the window of the bus. And when we got down to town, we rode the boat. <laughs> we would, we'd take a stroke and then Steve would run the, the, the bus a little. And we kept jumping through the main square of Crashbury <laughs> like we were rowing the boat. <laughs> um, Jen, I, I'm sure there's many other folks who want to say some things. Uh, I haven't been able to follow the chat. I've been busy with the moderating here can you know, some folks who want to get also want to jump in here i think i covered everybody in the chat room uh, but please feel free to unmute yourself at this point in time and um and jump in uh, i'd like to say something can you hear me i don't yes. know yes Greg. so when we were in russia uh jim barker and jack Solger were the were, were there together so we're down at the grandstands and we're shooting the breeze and having something. So Jack buys this bottle of what he thought was milk. But Jim and I both knew that it wasn't milk. It was like buttermilk or sour milk. So we just sit there. Jack opens the bottle up, takes a big swig and realizes that it's sour. Well, Jim and I just both sat there like, okay, we're not going to tell you. Now you've learned. <laughs> so we got back at Jack on that one. <laughs> Philadelphia could work together, though. Remember, well, yeah. Fred. Remember, yeah. the Russians locked us out of the boathouse. Oh, yeah. yeah. But when, yeah. They put, when they put the doors on the boathouse, right. they had the pins on the outside. So right. the smart guys from Philly and New York knocked the pins out, take the doors off so we could get to our boats and go out and row. I remember that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh. Well, you know, there was some uh, uh, the Russians had a their, at the regatta they had, they had a boat and had the sailor who stood up in front like a Russian sailor he had a striped shirt on and there was a big silver bell. bell. You remember that, Jimmy, on the front of the boat? Mm -hmm. And every time they would start out and go back, this guy would ring the bell, you know, and that was so I don't know. We we're going get we're in the airport going back or leaving Moscow. And I and I, I said, Where the wonder what the hell happened to the bell? And when that Jack Soldier pulls out a bag, yeah, <laughs> and rang the bell. <laughs> <laughs> so he stole the bell off the Russian boat. <laughs> so Jim, to make the story even better. Jack dies and Frank goes and he's he's taking Jack's house and he's looking for stuff. And he comes across this Russian bell. And it's like, <laughs> where did you get this Russian bell? <laughs> <laughs> oh, too funny. He stole love, he stole love to a rough ferry boat in Moscow. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh Okay, well, I guess Jen is there. Yeah, there. Um, just, 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 
Yeah, just a few notes in the um, chat room that I'll read aloud just in case uh, folks can't see them. Um, Mark, I'm going to butcher your last name. Mark Montplaisir. I think he's still on the line, so you're welcome to join in. But, yeah. uh, Mr. Bark, Mr. Barker, it was a privilege to row for you for a short time. You had a major impact on my life, and I'm so happy to see you. And from Diana Post, happy 90th, 90th year, Jim. Thank you for your great influence on rowing and so many lives. So great to get together this evening with my fellow admirers. Um, from Stephen Dexter, I have to unfortunately leave our granddaughter's fourth birthday. Uh, this is a great occasion in honor of the best rowing coach I have ever had. Um, so those are just some notes that people left um, before they had to exit. Thank you. As I said, I thank each and every one of you. And um, anyone else? You know, feel free to jump in. We're still on the air here, but if not, it will be um, we'll be signing off shortly. But uh, thanks again, and Jim, from me personally, once again, thank you for all the help you've given me over the years, and uh, I truly appreciate it. And I was a privilege Rick? to chair. Hey, Rick. Yes, can sir. You hear, can you hear me? It's John. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. I had an answer to one question. Someone said, and I got this right from Fred Leonard's own mouth. Someone said, who is Jim's anchor? Remember that question? And Fred <laughs> Leonard told me it was Joan. Joan Absolutely, yeah. Joan Barker. That's her. Absolutely, Fred Leonard said, Joan was Jim Barker's anchor. Mm -hmm. And yes, I always did. remember that. So mm -hmm. somebody asked who his anchor was, and I want everybody to know, it was Joan. Amen. 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 Okay, see. that's enough. Cheryl Bye. Cook. Hello. Cheryl hey, Cook. Um, Barbara Smith and Cheryl Cook here. Jim, love to see you. We miss seeing you. The pandemic has really uh, prevented us from spending some time together, as we always love to do. But before we wrap up, it, it's just wonderful to hear so many tributes. Um, I think everybody who's had the privilege of either rowing for you or having you as a mentor and in our view, the most important role in our life is, is you as our friend, um, really can all the comments just resonate. Um, the thing that is so remarkable uh, about you, uh, and I think it's, it's come through in, in all these other comments is you always made us believe we were capable of doing more than we thought we could do. And I think all of the people on this call have been spending the rest of their life trying to live up to your expectations. Um, and certainly I don't, and, and not only live up to your expectations, but also the wonderful example you've set. We love you, we love Joan, and we miss you. Thank you. Thank you. And we have one, we have one last uh, very important guest here. Um, Mike, would you, we'd love for um, Jim's great grandson to say the last few words here. Hi, my name is Will, and I just want to say I'm really proud of Pop, and I love Pop. Uh, <laughs> that's, the, that's the best tribute of all tonight. Thank you. Can I just I see one person there. I, You know, one of my dearest friends, and Cheryl knows who I'm talking about, Eddie Pressman. <laughs> We were rowing a double one day, going up the river, and uh, just going out for a row. And Ellen Carver, who was sitting in a single, just a little, the dry that me a bridge. And it was a, a, bird, a piece of wood sticking out of the river. And there was a bird sitting on it. And uh, we got it, Ellen said, oh, look, there's a yellow belly, whatever the heck. <laughs> As we're going by, Eddie Preston never said, or just said, are they good eating? <laughs> <laughs> they don't know on the boat. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Thank you all. Thank you, God bless you. Hey, Jim. Thank you, Thank you Jim. Jim. We love you, Jim. Love, love you, you Jim. Love you, Jim. Thank you. Love you. Bye. 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 Thank you, Jim. Bye. Happy holidays, Bye. Mr. Parker. Happy holidays, Jim. Thanks, all. Before everyone signs off, if I can...
this is Joe Henwood. Can I just uh, say before everyone signs off, this has really been great. I haven't seen many of you in many, many years, but I just want to let you know that some um, there were long circumstances of events. I just uh, became aware of the problem. I didn't become aware, just aware, but the problem with this dredging that's going on. And uh, I got some people came to me and I got involved and there is a solution, a good solution to all the problems that we're having getting rowing back on Boathouse Row. And I will, uh, if anybody wants to send me an email, I will drop you uh, a couple of videos on what the solution is beyond what's going on, been going on down there for the last several months. My email is joe.henwood, H-E-N-W-O-O-D, at verizon.net. If you're interested in knowing what that, what that solution is beyond what you're being told, I'll be happy to send it to you. Can I just, I just was remembered something that happened to me today, and I think everybody, Jimmy Teach probably appreciate this, but um, I, got a, I got a letter in the mail today. Mm -hmm. And it's from Stan Slazinski, the number three man in the U.S. 8 that won in Moscow, in, in, in uh, Tokyo. And he sent me an, a, a replica of the, of the gold medal. Wow. A commemorative coin. Commemorative yeah. And he said, it was great seeing you and talking with you on the gathering to help get, generate your, your 90th birthday. Thinking of you. Uh, and first whole Olympics challenge. Yeah. It's a lovely, like, commemorative coin from the Olympic Games in the Tokyo. That and he on the back to... side, it has it's Stan's super, name and his the seat he rode in Tokyo. Yeah, right. yeah exactly. He was yeah. In the Jimmy, three Jimmy, I talk to Stan three times a week. Yeah. He's one of my, uh, he is my best friend, and I will let yeah. him know that you uh, commemorated him and give him yeah. hell for not being on this call tonight. <laughs> yeah, number three seat, eight oared crew, Olympic right. champion of Tokyo, nineteen sixty four. Yep. That was really nice of him to send that. We that arrived today. That was super nice. And he told me that you coached him in the Schuylkill Navy. Uh, right. Hey, that's right. Yeah. 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 You didn't. Yeah. You didn't. You never coached. You didn't, you coached a lot of people, Jimmy. You really did a great job. Right, I can only get a dollar for all of them. I can do, be all right. You know? And of all the people I see on this call, the only two people that can recognize me from the back of my head is you and Jimmy Deese, because I, I don't think anybody else ever beat me. <laughs> <laughs> Whoa. Whoa. <laughs> but if anybody wants to get the skinny, the inside lane on what's going on with the dredging, and the possible a great solution to it, contact me, joe.henwood at verizon.net. And I will send, I will send you the, these videos that you will not believe. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. I think we've got... Uh, thank, thank you, thank, thank you, everyone. I, I, with all my heart, I thank you all. Mm -hmm. All right, Jim, I think everybody's going to sign off, so... <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. God Thank bless you. you all. Have a great day. Thanks for organizing this. Have a wonderful Thank holiday. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rick. Thank you, Rick. Thank, 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody from the Barker family. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <You're welcome. laughs> Say good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night, Liesl. Good night. Good night. I figure out how to do this. <laughs> Good night. <laughs> Cheryl, Good night, Alan. Good night. Cheryl and Barbara, are you going? Good Thank night. you. Good night, oh. Alan. <laughs> Good night, Good night Jim. Alan. Good night, Mike Barker. <laughs> uh,